It's Wednesday, June 4th, 2014. I'm Rim. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, Ghost in the Shell, Arise. Or at least the first two episodes. Let's do this. <laughs> so we got to see uh, Takashi Murakami's jellyfish eyes. Yeah, so basically it was really weird. So if you don't know, there's two Murakamis and people get them confused. Yeah, there's the one Q84. The author, Haruki yep. Murakami. But no, we're talking about super flat Murakami. Right, the guy we went to see his uh, art exhibit in Brooklyn some years ago. Yep, that was when we learned that most of the people in the world that we know were slow walkers. Anyway, so he was coming to the city because he made a movie. And I was like, well, I don't care what that movie is. He made it and he's going to be there. So I want to go to that. I tried to buy tickets, and their website basically didn't work. So I said, oh, well, I guess I didn't get tickets. And then I checked my credit card statement at the end of the month, and they charged me money. And I was like, hey, what the hell? So I went, called the box office. and was like, you charged me money for a thing I didn't get tickets to. They said, you did get tickets. I'm like, oh, shit, this thing is in like two days. I'm glad I checked with you. Yeah. So we went to see it. Yeah, it was crazy sold out. There were like 100 people hanging around hoping to get in on standby. Yep. And he was there. Like, we walk in, and Scott and our friends Phil and James. I, I mostly wanted to go, you know, because I knew the movie, good or bad, was going to look crazy because he made it. And it did. And I knew that I wanted to see what this guy was like because his art is crazy. <laughs> So we're not going to do too much of an in-depth review just because, you know, a movie like this, just go see it. Well, how are you going to see it? I'm sure there will be a way to see it at some gonna point. It's going to be a while before yeah. you have a chance to see it. I mean, I don't think it's on the internet yet. But it is beautiful. I will say that. It is absolutely beautiful the way it's filmed. The compositing is really good except for some of the weird fights at the end. The ca the creatures are actually really like cute and weird and except the one guy who just looks like a dude in a costume. <laughs> you don't like Luxor? Well, Luxor's size is uh, proportionate to the sadness in the heart of that little girl. Sure. <laughs> I, I think Luxor might actually be the best one in my book. Ah. Uh I don't know. The jellyfish dude was pretty cool because he was nah. the most badass. Nah. What about Coco? With the monkey? No. Coco was the uh, fighting game girl. Oh, well, that's... Yeah. Code to the second power, Coco. Yeah, no. Nah. I guess that kid was sadder than the girl who had Luxor because he had like a million Pokemon. He was the Hikikomori. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. This movie... It started out like it was going to be E.T., you know, kid finds a weird thing, hiding it from his parents, but then it immediately turns into Pokemon. And then it turns into Godzilla. Yep, pretty much. And the good things I can say about it, it was beautiful and weird, and I actually was surprised by it at a number of points. The bad things I can say about it, the child actors were kind of bad. <laughs> the story was pretty dumb oh, in the end. It is like a typical live action Japanese kids movie. Yep. The it reminded me a lot of actually juvenile. Yeah, pretty similar. Except without the uh this also had the Godzilla No one elements. listening to this knows what the fuck juvenile. Oh my god, juvenile. We should do a show on that. Yeah. I'd have to watch it again. How do we even fucking get that? It was on some random tape. Yep. In the anime club or some shit. We just saw this VHS tape and it was labeled juvenile. And we're like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> it's actually just Japanese E.T. Sure. Basically. Yep. But yeah, this thing was just, it has kind of this ham-fisted Fukushima sort of metaphor allegory about you have to have optimism and there's sadness and coming of age and there's a lot of ideas sort of just mishmashed together into it. So I can't say that it was good, but it was definitely enjoyable. But you got to enjoy some parts of it from the uh, perspective of, why is that cultist so angry? <laughs> he got what he wanted. None of the other cultists are angry. Uh, I guess in other news. There's it, other news? Not really. There is, there's hardly any news. But I just wanted to remind people, number one, Saga Volume 3 should be out now. Saga, 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 Trade Saga, Saga, paperback, Saga. right? And two, uh, at this, as of like some days ago, maybe even a week ago, the last episode of Gundam UC Unicorn is out. But anyway, things of the day. So this is pretty chill. This is basically one of those things where it's two cultures that aren't United States slash English-speaking Western world and commentary on each other, which is the kind of thing I always like. So it's the guy who's Malaysian, 
speaks Malaysian, speaks Japanese, and he's explaining mostly for the benefit of other people who aren't necessarily us about Japanese phrases and Japanese sayings and Japanese people do like this. That's this is it's very different from how Malaysian people do. And the vid- the best of his videos, I'll link to both of them because they're pretty great, is how to sp- how to use hi like a Japanese. Okay. And the four levels of the Japanese hey Hey, hey, it's really good. It's really good, especially if you don't speak Japanese that well, but you watch a lot of anime. If you watch these videos, you'll be like, oh, I get it. I think you sort of naturally get it. Uh, I feel he, like I already he points know out, the four he levels point, of A. You'd think so. The more uh, important or dangerous ones are actually shorter. Mm-hmm. All right. Hey has a profound theory. So, remember Retro Game Master? Do I ever? Game Center CX. Did you know there was a Retro Game Challenge 2 for the Nintendo DS? What? Why don't I own that? Because it never was and probably never will be released in English. Well, fuck, I'll just play it in Japanese, whatever. Well, you might be excited to know some fans just came out a few days ago with a translation patch. Wow. Get your DS emulators or DS piracy cards all fixed up. Patch that ROM and play the Game Center. That takes me back. It takes me back to a day when I discovered Final Fantasy V, and I had a ROM of it, but it was in Japanese. Then I found a patch that made that ROM in English, and oh fuck did I play that game. And also, oh fuck, did the translation not just sort of peter out about two-thirds of the way through? <laughs> <laughs> it just, that all the words got replaced with like sword icons and gibberish. Yep. So as a result, I never beat that game. All right. Also, fuck the shield dragon. <laughs> Meta moments. Book club book is a canticle for Leibowitz. It's I the, read like a chapter and then stopped. And it's the I precursor go back to book, the proto culture book too. All the like post apocalypse survival in a place with a color system books we've read recently. If anyone knows an earlier store instance of that story, please tell it to us. Wikipedia lists a few, but I think this one is the beginning of the modern era of post apocalypse survival. Right. Well, something I realized is that even the idea of a man-made apocalypse, right? I mean, it's Noah's Ark, right? But the idea that of- That wasn't a, made by man. No, that's what I'm saying, is that apocalypse is in general Noah's Ark, right? Or maybe even older than that, but- Well, Ragnarok. The idea, right, the idea of a man-made apocalypse, right? Didn't even, it, was, it wasn't even conceivable to people because we didn't have any things that could possibly do that. Well, right? imagine you're Roman. You're like, all right- so what, if, until, what do we do? Just start stabbing the earth and keep stabbing it until it dies? Right. It's like other than something that comes from God or nature or whatever, right? A, a, God, a God or nature or whatever. The only, we couldn't even conceive of a man-made apocalypse until we invented nuclear weapons, right? So this kind of story didn't really exist until we invented nuclear weapons, which was less than a century ago. And funnily enough, most of the post-apocalypses in these stories are caused by nuclear weapons. You don't say. You occasionally, know other- <laughs> occasionally you get the biological weapon, the zombie. Right, well, the only, the only stories that are, are otherwise are stuff like Cat's Cradle, where someone makes up something fictional, right? Like Ice Nine. Oh, yeah. Yep. In other news, you should join us at Kineticon, second week of June in the weekend. I think it's the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. Uh, Kineticon is not better than PAX Prime. No. It's not better than MAGFest, unless you're into anything other than gaming. Yep. And it's a better gaming con than almost every gaming con in the United States. All yep. rolled into one. Mm. So as we've said before, you know, we we run the panels and workshops department. So we scheduled, a, I think, a pretty badass schedule of panels and lectures and workshops and stuff. You but know what? It might be the best panels and lectures, period, at any con. Yeah, it might be, actually. I think I think we pretty much, you know, our department, you know, not to be all self-aggrandizing, but I think about the panels and lectures departments of other cons and their schedules, yep. and it's like the big cons mostly have industry panels, which are boring as hell, and the small cons just, you know, either they, they have, have Rainbow Dash. Right, and then the other cons, like Anime Boston, like it's really good, but it's anime only. Kineticon, we got... Panels on everything of the highest quality. Absolutely everything, except we don't have anything on the demo scene, so uh, email us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other meta things, you should go and find us on the internet. I mean, if you're listening to this, you probably already have, but we have many places on the internet. Twitter, IRC, 
newsletter, forum, Facebooks, Google yep. Pluses. We have everything. I feel like we should put that part at the end in the closer as opposed to in the meta moment. Well, people probably turn off the podcast by then. So they no, though, someone it. who listens for the first time, though, might listen to that because it explains some stuff. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know, guys. I'll say this. I'm going to highlight one thing. If you're going to interact with us in any way, the best way to you do that right now us. is to share our shit on Reddit. Mm. Because Reddit won't let you put your own stuff up, and people are really weird about that on Reddit. So it's up to you. The more popular you make our videos, the more videos we'll do. Right. Go. We need uh, people who like us to go and promote us because at least on Reddit. Yeah, it's hard to do otherwise. Maybe we should use our Project Wonderful money to buy some ads. I don't know. Uh, ads. <laughs> we just need someone. <laughs> we'll pay someone else to post our stuff on Reddit. Sure. Make a new account, a fake account, whatever. Yeah. Gig nights. Oh, fuck. I already fucked it up. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so pretty much since Standalone Complex second gig and then the uh, state pretty okay Solid State Society OAV came out, uh, I've, Madoka Magica was great. I really enjoyed Kill la Kill, but all I really want out of anime is more Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. Well, they're not going to get more of that, but you will get more Ghost in the Shell. In fact, we just did. Yep, and it's the closest thing to standalone complex that has come out since standalone complex. <laughs> it's the only Ghost in the Shell that's come out. Yes, since but complex. there have been no other anime that scratched that itch e at all. This is the only anime that scratches that yeah, itch you of think like some people would make some animes or mangas in a Ghost in the Shell ish cyberpunk genre. Yeah, cyberpunk. Of serious it's not a dystopia. That's not Ghost in the Shell. It's not a utopia. It's just kind of a realistic future of cybertech and cyberspace and all that stuff. Mm. But at the same time, procedural police drama. Yep. <laughs> so. Not going to spoil a million things. We'll spoil a few things because we didn't see all of Arise. Because it's not all out yet. Much like Gundam Unicorn, I was originally going to wait until all of it was out and then watch it all at once. But you know what? They went and put episodes one and two uh, in a theater in New York City. And I'm like, well, might as well go see it. And yep. we went to see it. And you know what? I'm glad we watched it on the big screen because... It was where... really loud. It, it wasn't that loud. It was loud. I've been in louder theaters. Where... The plot of a Ghost in the Shell standalone complex season would encompass, you know, a certain thing. Like, there's a corrupt politician, we finally bring him down. Every episode of this has about the same amount of plot. But there's also this sort of uh, overarching plot to the whole thing, right? Yep. The formation of Section 9 and whatnot. Well, of course, we know pretty much the gist of it, at least from all the other Ghost in the Shell media. Right, but you're getting all these details that may or may not conflict with previous canon. Yeah, it already conflicts a couple of times in tone with uh, standalone complexes backstories. Yeah, and some of the characters are different. Like Saito is pretty excitable, but <laughs> standalone complex is super serious. I like excitable is probably the best way to describe it. Right, him. but he's super serious in standalone complex and other Ghost in the Shells. It's like, why did they change his personality? Or maybe. He's They're just going to show us his personality changing. But no, because the, there was a flashback in Standalone Complex that showed him in the past being super serious. So yep. that doesn't make sense, right? That's just one example. Um, but other things are perfectly match with the canon. Like Togusa is a de detective and he's getting noticed, right? And probably, you know, that's probably going to match up really well. And, you know, Bato's a, a ranger and he seems pretty similar too. Yep. So. But everyone's definitely their younger self. Like they have more energy. They're, they're surprisingly all kind of snarky with each other. Mm. And they all mostly know who each other are. Like they're all kind of famous or infamous within their various spheres. Right. Well, it's like, you know, say John Carmack's walking down the road. Most people are not going to know who he is, and if he opens his mouth, people are going to be like, oh, it's Professor Frank, because <laughs> yeah. the way he talks. But if we see him walking down the road, it'd be like, whoa, is that John Carmack over there? Because oh he's gosh. in our industry, right? So these people are all in you know, the military, you know, law enforcement you know, industry, so they know each other because they're all infamous badasses. So... The interesting thing, though, is that at least because every episode is pretty much standalone as a movie, even though it kind of reveals the greater I think world you need of to Ghost watch in the them in Shell. Order. You can't just go watch an episode. I wasn't two. gonna say watch them out of order. I'm saying you can watch one episode and be totally satisfied. Yeah, you can do that. You don't need to wait for the next episode to come out. There are no yeah, cliffhangers. There's no, yet. There's no cliffhangers, right? It, it, yeah, it was. Each one is like a whole movie's worth, right? They, it resolves so. 
You know, there isn't there isn't like, well, st- you know, continued in the next episode or anything like that. So if you're a fan of standalone complex, like the previous sets of Ghost in the Shell, what I would say is primarily different is that the world is much freer with crazy military technology. Mm. I don't know if that's to a greater point, like society is still a little lawless or there's still a lot of military hardware hanging around after the war. But I mean, in early episodes, bad guys have like military tanks and military shit and they're just blowing things up. Landmines everywhere. Oh, landmines look like uh, pre yeah. and girls. Yeah, you know, maybe that could actually be a result of, you know, well, first of all, it's the political situation in the country at the time. Right. You know, they talk a bit about, you know, how, how things are kind of unstable. There. Yep. Well, I mean, the military is getting reorganized, which is like the backdrop for everything. Right. Like every military group is basically trying to protect itself. A lot of people committed war crimes. and It's shady shit during the actual war. Right. And you could almost, you know, say that, you know, all the, the, the difference in the world here in Arise versus the difference in standalone complex and other ghosts in the shells is you know, the results of the work of Section 9, right? It's like they did a good job, therefore yeah. things became this way. Because watching this and now... And the only then the cyber crimes they have to deal with are, you know, the only ones that are left are like super high-level amazing people hidden deep in the net and all the things on the service level have sort of been cleaned up. You know, by the major and team. Yeah, but it's interesting how pointed all of that is. Like, the backdrop really fits with the way this show is working. Violence is the answer much more readily, and (laughs) the plots are actually pretty straightforward because everyone's corrupt. I mean, when the major tricks the one politician in the car to spill in the beans... His beans are the smallest of beans, and it seems like everybody has a lot of beans. Yeah. Everybody. Except Aramaki. Yeah. And Granted, team. all they had to do was find the other coffin. They would have been good. Yeah, well, it's not easy uh, to find. It was hiding. It was right there. <laughs> I carried this coffin around with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm working on a meme mashup with that guy from Cowboy Bebop in this episode. <laughs> How about also some uh, Trigun in there? Oh, yeah. I could get uh, Mid Valley, or not Mid Valley Horn Freak, uh, Legato Blue Summers. Yep. And, uh, and carrying that coffin. <laughs> Man, the Trigon manga is pretty. And fucked. you could also put in, uh, well, maybe you could mix in the grave in Fist of the North Star. <laughs> he's, he's gonna, he's like, I dug this grave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, he's gonna make him fit in it. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. I gotta put that thing together. Yeah. Uh, the major is interesting in that she's still you can very recognizably her character, but she's a lot more openly surly Mm. and a lot more direct like she finds out a thing she goes immediately straight at that thing yep also she gets hacked like she's not 100 percent yet she's not the goddess of hacking yet yeah well the body that she has here is not you know the body that she has for i guess you know the cyborg body that she has for most of the ghost in the shell not the crazy military body right it's not like she doesn't have the guns coming out of her arms and shit or anything like that right it's just sort of a really good cyborg body she got from when she was in the military. And at the start, like, the military still owns it, right? Yeah. So. In fact, the show makes a big deal about that, too. Like, they have all these nice subtle touches about how basically full-body cyborgs are not really a thing outside of the military. Yeah, like, much. people well, you don't... Can't aff- even, even in other Ghost in the Shells, it's like, no one can afford that. Yep, except well, ultra-rich people can. You know, like most it's out pe- there. Well, I mean, that's why you have people like even someone who owns a company like Jameson, right? He's in a little tiny box because well, he prefers that body. I'm just saying, but that's the why. You know, and yeah. even if they do have a full body cyborg, they don't have a good one. It's not like the ma- the fact that the majors. That's that's true through all Ghost in the Shell, right? That she basically always has like the best possible cyborg body. That's a full cyborg body. No one could even tell. They'd be like, "Whoa, that's a full cyborg body! Holy shit!" Right? Because most full cyber bodies are really crappy. But as a result, we get this interesting thing that actually fits with the old shows where they, they're really worried about personal freedom and personal attitude and the ability to fight for what they want and whatever and not being beholden to anyone except by, you know, consent. And, uh, you know, s- control yeah. <laughs> by being hacked because yeah. you're a computer. But in this one, there's all these characters want something and can't go after it because they work within an organization that's hobbled by bureaucracy. Mm. And basically the story of Ghost in the Shell is as it's always been. All the people who want justice and who are smart band together to semi-legally pursue justice and do that via Batman. (laughs) 
<laughs> Cyber Batman. Yes, that is the plot of Ghost in the Shell. But with a rise, it is open. It is out there. That just that is what they are doing a hundred percent. Yeah. The show is also ultra ultra action. Mm. Very little of well, I think the because it's an OAV because you're getting you know so much time in there, right? It's like they got to fill it with awesome action scenes. You have a big budget, how do you blow it? And right? I think in every, yeah, Explosions. apparently in every episode they're going to spend a lot of detail on one of the major's arms being blown off. That's how it goes. <laughs> Two episodes in a row, but bam, boom. <gasps> Yeah. But everyone's bodies get injured a lot. But well, they... when you have cyborg bodies, that's something you can do that you couldn't do otherwise. So you... True, but in standalone complex, when like someone needs to replace a part of their body, that's a big goddamn deal. Mm-hmm. And it kind of hobbles them for a while. And in this OAV, they pretty much are immediately fine. Yeah. Uh, I think the major difference between this and the other Ghost in the Shells is that the you know the original Ghost in the Shell movie and even standalone complex right sort of has this really mysterious kind of thing like ooh what's going on in the net ooh who's the laughing man ooh what's nah. going and it's like you'll get to the end of an episode and it won't be fully explained like what really happened there we know most of it but not all the details and. You know, you got sort of that like that cyber eeriness going on, right? Where not everything's explained. In this, everything is literally and in plain text explained to you. Except for the higher level meta. Right. Of course. But they pretty much explain everything. Someone just says right out everything that happened in a given episode at some point. So nothing it's not like what really happened. No, you just saw everything literally just happen. Right. There's no eeriness of like, hmm, what's what's going on? Who's the what's that guy up to? You know, there's no mystery whatsoever. Yep. And coupled with the fact that there's no mystery, it doesn't read like it there's doesn't. There's no terrible secret of space either. Well, other than the ones we already know about from other ghosts in the shells, or sure. the sort of open questions of like, what is going to happen in the future with this society? Mm. There's also very little that like you can see foreshadowing of things in other ghosts in the shells, right? It's like, okay, so there's these logicomas, clearly they're Tachikoma precursors. Yep. But it's only really blatant stuff like that. There's nothing else sort of like hinting at the laughing man or the puppeteer or any you know, anything coming down the line. Yeah, there's all. a little bit of reference to the puppeteer with the, the a certain spy. I didn't notice any. Uh the the, the AI? Oh, uh, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. That th- that was definitely... But notice how that was inconceivable to them at that point. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, inter- it's interesting to watch the show. I like it a lot. I don't like it as much as I liked actual standalone complex because it's missing a lot of the key elements that make a standalone complex a standalone complex. Mm. It's not directed by Kenji Kamiyama, yep. the new one. And the music in the new one is... Not the same kind of music as every other Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, the music's not that exciting. It's the, like, music's so, the music is very a lot like the Akira soundtrack, where it's sort of like boom, 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 right? You know, which it's, has its you place. Got some chanting and some some noises, right? Mostly, you know? it's the opener is just really kind of milk toast. Mm. The opener to both standalone complexes just drives you crazy. Like you are pumped up and ready to jump off of buildings backwards. Yeah, <laughs> but then you watch this opener and you're like, "Can this? Your, can we just cyber butt pass someone's face. this opener and get back to the fighting yep. and the show?" Yep. Really like to get back to that. So I don't know much about the guy who directs this new one. Mm. I haven't really done much research on this yet because we're gonna not, we're gonna do a real review after we see the whole thing. Sure. I mean, if we reviewed standalone complex after a couple episodes, nah, yeah. it's just a completely standalone procedural police drama. Yep, which is awesome. Well, also, but, you know, another seat, right? You yeah, know, stuff happens. So who knows? Maybe like the next episode will say to be continued or something like that. You don't know. Yeah, we don't know at all. Right. But yeah, I mean, if you like Ghost in the Shell, you'll still like this and want to watch it after you've watched all the other Ghost in the Shells. Yeah, but and now I really just want to go back and watch Standalone Complex. Sure. I have this real urge to just watch. In fact, I watched an episode. Most of it's on YouTube for free legally, as far as I can tell. No, how about that? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, yeah. Maybe this will be one day. 
If you're a fan of Ghost in the Shell, watch this however you can. It's up. It's, it's in your wheelhouse. There's no other anime for you to watch. Kill La Kill's done. Uh, Madoka done, was done a long time ago. Uh, Attack on Titan's got a long time before anything new's coming out with that. Sailor Moon will be there for yep. a long time. It's not going anywhere. Yep. Of course, if you don't watch it as it's trickling out, it might be hard to bite down on that 200-episode monster. I watched all of Fist of North Star after it was all out. True. And then there's the new Sailor Moon, which that I'm going to watch like as it comes out. Yeah, probably. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>